This video contains solutions to practice problems from section 3.6 on numerical integration. For these first few examples, we're going to be using the techniques that we've learned to approximate integrals. Now, many of these integrals we can actually find the exact answer for using the, uh, our knowledge of integrals, but the point here is to practice using the different methods that we have for estimating the values of these integrals. So first one's asking us to calculate L3 for the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x dx. So L means left-hand endpoints, which means we're finding areas of rectangles using left-hand endpoints of subintervals. So what we want to do is take this interval from 1 to 2 and break it up into three pieces. That's what this 3 is telling us. That's how many rectangles we're going to have, which means we're going to have two dividing lines in between the 1 and the 2 that are going to be the bases of our three rectangles. So to figure out where those dividing lines are, we want to calculate delta x, which is b minus a divided by n. So whenever we're talking about delta x in the context of approximating integrals, this is the formula we're going to use. b and a are the bounds on my integral, so 2 minus 1, and n is again the number of rectangles we have. So 2 minus 1 over 3, that's 1 third. And so what that means is that each of these intervals is 1 third of a unit wide. And that's going to help me figure out where those dividing lines are because to figure out where the first dividing line is, I'm gonna take one and I'm going to add one third to one, which is gonna give me four thirds. And then I'm gonna take four thirds and add another one third, which is gonna give me five thirds. And then just as a double check, I like to do the final addition and add that last one third and make sure that I end up at two, which is where I do, I get six thirds, which is the same as two. Okay. Now that's where our dividing lines are. Which numbers do we use to find the heights of our rectangles? Well, that's where the letter L comes in. The letter L is telling us we're going to find the we're going to use the left-hand endpoint of each of these subintervals. So our first left-hand endpoint is 1. So from 1 to 4 thirds, the left-hand endpoint of that subinterval is 1. My second left-hand endpoint is 4 thirds. From 4 thirds to 5 thirds, the left-hand endpoint of that subinterval is the 4 thirds. And my third left-hand endpoint is 5 thirds. From 5 thirds to 2, my left-hand endpoint is 5 thirds. Notice that I'm not actually going to use the 2 for anything, right? The 2 was there kind of as the right-hand endpoint of my whole interval, but because I'm using the left-hand endpoints, the 2 never actually gets used. So what's my estimate? So L3 is going to be f of x1 star multiplied by delta x plus f of x2 star multiplied by delta x plus f of x3 star multiplied by delta x. Those f values, those are the heights of my rectangles, and the delta x, that's the base of my rectangle. So what I'm really doing is calculating the area of three separate rectangles and adding those all together. So f of x1 star, that's f of 1. Delta x, we've already said, is 1 third. f of x2 star, that's f of 4 thirds, and delta x is 1 third. And f of x3 star, that's f of 5 thirds, and delta x is again 1 third. And 1 over x, that's my f, right? So when I say f of 1, I mean 1 over 1. When I say f of 4 thirds, I mean 1 over 4 thirds. So I calculate all that, estimate it all together, and I get approximately 0.783. And that's my value of L3. So in this next one, we're going to do something very similar, but now we're doing R4. So that changes a couple of the details, but the general process is pretty similar. So again, the first thing that you should do is figure out delta x, which is always is b minus a divided by n. In this case, that's 3 minus 0 divided by 4, or 3 quarters, or 0.75. And again, what we're going to do with that is we're going to take our interval from 0 to 3, and we're going to divide it up into four equal pieces, which means I'm going to have three extra little dividing lines in the middle there. And to figure out where the dividing lines are, I'm going to continually add 0.75. So when I add 0.75 to 0, I get 0.75. If I add another 0.75, I get 1.5. If I add another 0.75, I get 2.25. And if I add the final 0.75, I get to 3, which is where I expected to get. Now, because I'm using right-hand endpoints, my right-hand endpoints of each subinterval, these are going to be the numbers on the right ends of each of those little pieces. So 0 0.75, 1 1.5, 2.25, and 3. So my estimate R4 is f of x1 star times delta x plus f of x2 star times delta x. Again, these are all just bases times heights of rectangles. f of x3 star times delta x. And since I've got four rectangles, I have to go to f of x4 star times delta x. So this is f of 0.75 times my delta x, which is 0.75, f of 1.5 times 0.75, 
f of 2.25 times 0.75 and f of 3 times 0.75. And again, all of those f's, this is the function, that's my f of x, that's the function that I'm plugging into. So I work all that out, I approximate it all together, and I end up with 12.827. All right, what about M? So M stands for midpoint. And so we're still finding areas of rectangles, but now instead of using the left-hand endpoint or the right-hand endpoint, we're going to use the number that's right smack in the middle of each of those subintervals. But first we need to figure out where those subintervals are, where the dividing lines are. So we're going to start out similarly to what we just did. So first things first, what's my delta X? It's B minus A divided by N. So this is four minus two divided by three, which is the same as two thirds. So my interval goes from 2 to 4. I've got three subintervals, which means I've got two extra dashes, two extra dividing lines in between 2 and 4. And using my delta x, I can figure out that this number is 8 thirds and this number is 10 thirds. But I don't actually want to use any of those numbers that I've written there. I want to use the midpoint. I want to use the number that's exactly halfway in between each of them, those numbers. So where are those numbers? Well, whenever you want to find a number that's halfway in between two other numbers, you're going to add those two numbers together and divide by two. And if I work that out, that's going to work out to be seven thirds. This number is going to be nine thirds, also known as three. And this number is going to be 11 thirds. So those are my xi stars. So when I say m3 is f of x1 star times delta x plus f of x2 star times delta x, plus f of x3 star times delta x. The star numbers that I'm saying there, those are these numbers that we just calculated, 7 thirds, 3, and 11 thirds. So this is going to be f of 7 thirds multiplied by my delta x, which is 2 thirds, f of 9 thirds, or 3, multiplied by my delta x, which is 2 thirds, and f of 11 thirds multiplied by delta x, which is 2 thirds. And again, I'm plugging into this function, natural log of x, and we add that all together and approximate, and we end up with our value of M3, which is 2.163. All right, next up we're using T. Now T here stands for trapezoid, which means we're no longer gonna be finding areas of rectangles, we're gonna be finding areas of trapezoids. So the formula for T is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna start out with a delta X over two, and then we're gonna multiply that by the sum of various values of my function. So it's gonna be f of x zero plus two times f of x one plus two times f of x two. And I continue with twos, two times f of x three until I get to the last one. And I know the last one is four because it's t four and that is just f of x four. So the way you wanna think about this is that inside those parentheses, we have twos everywhere except at the very beginning and at the very end. That's the only place where we don't multiply by two. What are those x values? Notice the stars are gone, right? So now there's no choices for figuring out which of those numbers I'm using. I'm using all of the numbers. So I've got to figure out my delta x just like before, b minus a over n, which is pi minus zero divided by four, or pi over four. I'm taking my interval from zero to pi, dividing it up into four pieces. So I'll have four dividing lines. Using that delta x, I figure out that this is pi over four, pi over two, and three pi over four. And I'm using all five of those numbers. This zero, that's x zero. X four, or sorry, pi over four, that's x one. Pi over two, that's my x two. Three pi over four, that's my x three. Pi, that's my x four. So this is gonna be pi over four divided by two times f of zero plus two times f of pi over four plus two times f of pi over two make that look a little nicer for you. Two times f of pi over two plus two times f of three pi over four. And then finally plus f of pi. And so again, this is our function that we're plugging into. That's our f of x. So all of those that's, you know, just plugging and chugging away on our calculator and we work that all together and that's going to work out to be approximately 1.571. All right, and the final one of these where we're actually computing estimates for integrals is S. And in this case, the S stands for Simpson. So we're going to be using Simpson's rule. So the formula for Simpson's rule is pretty similar to the formula for the trapezoidal rule. So S4 here. One difference is that we have a 
delta x divided by 3 on the outside. And then inside the brackets, we have a slightly different pattern. Again, we're going to start out with f of x 0. But this time, instead of having 2s all the way down, we're going to have alternating 4s and 2s. So it's going to be 4 times f of x 1 plus 2 times f of x 2 plus 4 times f of x 3 and going back and forth between 4 and 2 and 4 and 2 and 4 and 2 until we get to the end. The end is at 4 because we're doing s4. And at the very end, we get no number at all, right? So again, you don't have any coefficient of the very first f, no coefficient on the very last f, and then in the middle, it's alternating 4s and 2s, starting with a 4 and ending with a 4. One of the things that we have to do for Simpson's rule is we actually have to have an even number of subdivisions. We can't use Simpson's rule if we have an odd number of subdivisions. So you'll never be asked to compute S7, for example, because seven is not an even number. So we can't actually use Simpson's rule unless we have an even number of divisions. All right, so to figure out what those X values are, we're gonna do the same thing that we've done four times already. We're going to do it one more time here. Delta x is b minus a divided by n. So that's going to be 3 minus 1 divided by 4, also known as 1 half or 0.5. So I take my interval from 1 to 3, and I'm going to divide it into four equal pieces. So three extra hash marks in the middle there. This will be 1.5, this will be 2, and this will be 2.5. So this is going to be delta x over 3, or 0.5 divided by 3, times f of 1 plus 4 times f of 1.5, plus 2 times f of 2, plus 4 times f of 2.5, plus f of 3. And again, this is the function that we're plugging all those numbers into. We do all that plugging and chugging on our calculator, and we end up with negative 1.295. And if you're a little bit thrown off by that negative value, if you actually graph this function over the interval from 1 to 3, you'll see that the function is negative, and that's why we're getting negative values for our function, and so it makes sense to get a negative value for our integral. In these next few problems, we're going to try to work on bounding the error that can occur when making these approximations. So in this problem, we're asking for the maximum absolute error when m100 is used to approximate this integral. So the idea here is that we can definitely do M100. We can, uh, it would be tedious, there would be a lot of calculations, we'd probably want to have a computer do it for us, but we can definitely calculate M100. And we know that that's not going to be the exact value of this integral, it's going to be an approximation. But what we don't know is how far off that approximation is going to be. We can't know the exact error because we don't know the exact value of this integral. So instead what we want to do is try to bound the error. And what we have are formulas for various methods that help us get a handle on how big the error can be. In the case of the midpoint rule, which is what we're talking about here, the error bound is that the error for mn is less than or equal to capital M times b minus a cubed divided by 24n squared. So we know what a, b, and n are. What's capital M? So capital M here is the maximum value of the absolute value of the second derivative of our function on this interval, on the interval from a to b. And so we get that by creating a graph. So what I've got here is a graph that I've gotten from desmos.com, but you can use any computer algebra system, any graphing system that can compute derivatives. And so in this case, I've typed in f of x equals x e to the minus x, and then I've asked it to graph f double prime of x on the interval from 0 to 1. And so what I see here is that this is the maximum value of the absolute value of f double prime of x. And so we're going to use the value capital M equaling 2. So careful here, we don't want to use negative 2, right, because we want to have absolute value. So alternatively, I could have had Desmos graph the absolute value of f double prime of x. But in this case, I just graphed f double prime of x. And I'm just, if I get a negative value, then I want to use the absolute value of that. So again, here, this would be a value of about 0.2, and so that's a lower value than 2. So I want to use the most extreme value of the absolute value of the second derivative. All right, so if I plug all this information into my error bound, I get 2 b minus a, so that's 1 minus 0, cubed, divided by 24, and my n is 100. And so I just calculate all that, and I end up with 8.333 times 10 to the negative 6. And so that's not the exact value of the error. That doesn't tell me exactly how far off my estimate M100 is, but it tells me how the maximum possible error that I could have when making that approximation. 
So similar problem here. This time we're talking about T40. So the error bound for Tn is less than or equal to capital M times B minus A cubed divided by 12 N squared. So almost the exact same formula, but with a 12 instead of a 24. And then we're going to use the graphing utility here to do the same idea. So in this case, again, I'm graphing F double prime of X on my interval from four to six. It looks like this is my most extreme value, which again, if I look at my scale here, here's 0 0.05. So this is 0 0.06, 0 0.07. It's a little bit more than 0 0.07. So I'm going to use 0 0.08 as my upper bound. When you're using capital M here, you want to err on the side of caution, right? You want to go up a little bit uh, versus going down. We don't want to round down because then our error might actually be a little bit more than what we're uh, using. So we want to use a, a larger value of capital M. And so it's always better to fudge upward when you're using your graphing utility and you can't tell exactly where that max value is. So I'm using 0.08 here. So my error bound formula looks like 0.08. B minus A, that's six minus four cubed divided by 12 times 40 squared. And I just calculate all that and I get 3.333 times 10 to the minus five. So that's my maximum possible error for T40 in this problem. Next up, we're talking about S20. Now Simpson's rule, one of the reasons why we like Simpson's rule, even though it's got a more complicated formula, is that it's actually much more accurate than any of the rectangle methods or the trapezoidal method that we've talked about. And the error bound for Sn is less than or equal to capital M, but capital M has a different definition here. I'll get to that in a second. B minus A to the fifth power divided by 180 times N to the fourth. And that end of the fourth in the bottom of this fraction is very powerful. That means I can get really accurate estimates for relatively small values of n. Okay, but what's capital M here? So unlike the formulas that we talked about in the previous two problems, capital M here is the maximum value of the fourth derivative, absolute value of f quadruple prime of x on the interval from a to b. So rather than graphing f double prime of x, I have to graph f quadruple prime of x. And this is really where it's important to use a utility that can do those derivatives for you. Yes, we could in theory manually by hand calculate the fourth derivative of the square root of one plus x squared, but that would be a really time consuming process. And if we've got a utility that can do that for us, then we wanna go ahead and use it. So I've graphed that fourth derivative on this interval from zero to one. And again, my most extreme value, the value that's farthest away from zero is right there where it, it looks like it equals negative three. So that means I'm gonna let M be positive three. Remember this absolute value means that even if I get a negative extreme value, I wanna flip the sign around and make it positive. So my error bound looks like three. B minus A is one minus zero to the fifth power divided by 180. My N here is 20 and I'm gonna raise that to the fourth power. And when I work all that out, I end up with 1.042 times 10 to the minus seven. Very small error, even though we'd only be using 20 subdivisions. Okay, now these last couple of problems are really where these error bounds get used, where the idea is, look, we want to estimate a particular inter integral we have a tolerance for how much error we can accept in the estimate, but what we don't know is how many rectangles we should use we, or how many subdivisions we should use. We have a general sense that more subdivisions gives us a better estimate, but what if we have a target value of error that we're trying to get within? We don't wanna wonder, ooh, well, I used 100 subdivisions. Was that enough? Was that accurate enough to get me where I wanted to be? We wanna be sure. And so the idea here is that we use our error bound, right? So we know that the error for Tn is less than or equal to capital M times B minus A cubed divided by 12N squared. And so how do we make that number, that error, be less than 3.2 times 10 to the minus five? Well, what we do is we make that fraction be less than 3.2 times 10 to the minus five, because this is an inequality that we can solve. And if we solve that inequality and get a value of N that makes that happen, then that will make this inequality happen because this is guaranteed and then we make this happen. We make this happen by the algebra work that we're gonna do here in just a second. So we make that second inequality happen and then that will make the error be less than the target that we want. Okay, so now we focus on making that second inequality happen. We use our graph here to get capital M. I'm gonna use the value of 0.3 from reading that graph. B minus A, that's four minus three cubed 
divided by 12 n squared. Remember, n is unknown here because we're trying to figure out the proper value of n to use to get this error bound to happen. So we're going to multiply both sides by 12 n squared. So we get 0.3, because 4 minus 3 is just 1, is less than 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5 times 12 n squared. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides of that inequality by 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5, and I'm going to divide both sides by 12. So what I end up with is n squared is greater than 781.25. So I just work that out on my calculator. So I can flip that around to make it a little easier to read. n squared is greater than 781.25. And if n squared has to be greater than 781.25, then that means that n would have to be greater than the square root of 781.25 which is approximately 27.95. So the way to get our inequality to happen is to make n be greater than 27.95, which means we need to use at least 28 subdivisions. So we could use 28, we could use 100, we could use 5,000. Any of those values of n will make this error bound that we were shooting for happen, and then we'll get the error that we want. All right, similar problem here, except this time using Simpson's rule. But same basic idea, we have a target value of error that we want to get within, and so we want to know what value of n is going to make that happen. So we know that our error for Sn is less than or equal to capital M times b minus a to the fifth divided by 180 n to the fourth, and so we want to make that be less than 10 to the minus 6. That will make our error be less than 10 to the minus 6. So capital M from reading my graph, I'm going to use the value 6, right? I see here it goes down below negative 5, but doesn't quite cross this line at, at negative 6. So I'm going to use positive 6 as my value for M. B minus A here is 3 minus 1 to the fifth power, divided by 180 n to the fourth. And again, I want to make that less than 10 to the minus 6. So on the left-hand side, I've got 6 times 2 to the 5th. I'm going to multiply both sides by 180 n to the 4th. So I've got 10 to the minus 6 times 180 n to the 4th. I'll divide both sides by 10 to the minus 6 times 180. So all I'd be left with on the right-hand side is n to the 4th. So that's going to give me n to the 4th is greater than 1.0667 times 10 to the 6th power. And then I take the fourth root of both sides. That's going to give me n greater than 32.137. Now, it's important that we don't round down here, right? Or what this is telling us is to get the error that we want, n has to be greater than 32.137. So if we round that to 32, then 32 is not greater than 32.137. It's just underneath that. And so if we're extremely unlucky, our error could actually be slightly too big if we don't use greater than 32.137 subdivisions, which means we're going to have n have to be at least 33. And actually, because Simpson's rule requires even numbers, it would actually have to be at least 34 subdivisions to get the error that we want.